This video lecture is part one of the nervous system medications. We'll review the nervous system function. We're going to discuss agonists and antagonists of the system. We're going to briefly review analgesics again, and we'll talk about anesthetics. The nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which are the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is divided into the somatic nervous system, which are all our voluntary muscles that we have conscious control over. The second division is the autonomic nervous system, which is involuntary. The autonomic nervous system controls our internal organs. This system is broken down into the sympathetic nervous system, which controls the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps our body rest and digest. The nervous system medications act on the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. A synapse is the gaps between the nerves. Most of our medications act at that synapse to adjust messages by the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that facilitate the movement of messages across the synapse. Acetylcholine and epinephrine are the two main neurotransmitters that affect the autonomic nervous system. We'll also discuss other neurotransmitters in the next video. Because these drugs are powerful and most cross the blood-brain barrier, serious side effects can result, so always think about that when you give these type of medications. These medications can be used to treat pain, anxiety, depression, mania, insomnia, convulsions, and schizophrenia. So here's the sympathetic nervous system. I think of S for sympathetic and stress. This system prepares our bodies for action. When this system is triggered, our heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. Our bronchioles dilate so we can breathe better while we're running. There's constriction of the blood vessels in many parts of our body, but dilation of blood vessels to the muscles so that we can run. Our digestion slows down, our mouth gets dry, our pupils dilate so we can see better where we're running. A nerve cell that releases epinephrine or adrenaline, these two terms are pretty much used interchangeably, are referred to as adrenergic. Think of adrenaline, adrenergic. So when we give adrenergic medications or adrenergic blockers, can you imagine what happens? So here we are with the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. I think of the parasympathetic nervous system as Dollsville. Nothing exciting is happening. When this system is in play, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. The cholinergic nerve cells release acetylcholine. So think of cholinergic acetylcholine. So I use the mnemonic Dollsville for the parasympathetic nervous system. This is when you have digestion, defecation, urination, lacrimation, learning. This is when we have clarity and the ability to remember things. You know, our patients with Alzheimer's have a severe depletion of acetylcholine. And lastly, we have salivation. So when we give these medications, can you imagine what happens if we give cholinergic or anticholinergic medicines? With anticholinergic, always think of the opposite effect. So instead of digestion, defecation, we're going to have constipation. We'll have urinary retention, dry eyes, confusion, and dry mouth. These cholinergic and adrenergic chemicals occur naturally in our body, but there are times when we need to modify this reaction. So here we are with adrenergic agonists. Again, remember an agonist is a drug that binds to the receptor to activate the receptor. So we use these medications when the body needs excited. These drugs mimic the sympathetic nervous system, so we have an increase in cardiac output, because of vasoconstriction, and we can reestablish heart rhythm by increasing the conduction through the AV node. Because of the vasoconstriction that these medications cause, blood pressure can be raised during shock. We can constrict the capillaries if the patient is bleeding. For asthmatic patients, we can use adrenergic agonists to open the airway, and we can use these medications to dilate the pupils for eye procedures. Epinephrine or adrenaline is an example of an adrenergic agonist. Remember that an antagonist or blocker is a drug that binds to the receptor and prevents a reaction of the receptor. So we have adrenergic blockers which prevent the action of adrenaline. 
We can block these effects and the heart will slow down. The blood vessels re will relax. When this happens, the heart doesn't have to work so hard. So we can treat high blood pressure and we can increase the blood flow to the heart, which can treat angina or chest pain with these medications. Blocking adrenaline can also block the impulses that cause an irregular heart rhythm. Blocking the sympathetic response or fight or flight can also help patients with panic attacks or PTSD. Altenolol is an example of an adrenergic antagonist or a beta blocker. Remember, receptors are proteins on the cell and adrenergic receptors are stimulated with fight or flight. You know, there are three different types of sympathetic or adrenergic receptors. Alpha receptors, beta-1 receptors, and beta-2 receptors, and we have medications that affect these different receptors. Alpha-1 receptors are located in smooth muscle, which include the walls of the blood vessels. Remember, with fight or flight, the smooth muscle constricts, so we get decreased blood flow to the digestive system and constriction of the bladder. So with alpha adrenergic blockers, arteries relax, which decrease blood pressure, and the smooth muscle in the prostate relaxes, so these medications can help a man urinate if they have BPH, or benign prosthetic hypertrophy, or an enlarged prostate. Beta-1 receptors are in the heart. Beta-1, one heart. And when they're stimulated, they increase the heart rate and the blood pressure goes up. So beta blockers slow the heart rate and force the contraction down, and these medications are used for hypertension. Beta-2 receptors are located in the bronchioles of the lungs, and when they're stimulated, the diameter of the bronchioles increase to let more air in. Albuterol is a commonly used beta-2 agonist and is used for dyspnea or shortness of breath. So consider these actions when we give an adrenergic agonist, which means the drug binds to the receptor and activates it, or an antagonist, and these medications bind to the receptor and they prevent a reaction. So we have your adrenergic blockers. We have alpha and beta blockers or antagonists. Examples are alpha-1 adrenergic blockers and these end with SIN and again they treat hypertension and BPH. Terazosin or hytrin is an example of this. Beta-1 adrenergic blockers or beta blockers, these end in OLOL and these are a really common medication to treat hypertension. We also can use beta blockers for glaucoma because they decrease the production of intraocular fluid. Because the cholinergic side of things slow the heart rate down and they constrict the airway, these cholinergic agonist medications are rarely used. Nerve gas and pilocarpine are examples of these medications. With open angled glaucoma, which is the most common, the drainage tube for the aqueous humor becomes blocked and the pressure builds up in the eye, causing loss of vision if untreated. So we can use a cholinergic medicine like pilocarpine to increase this. Cholinergic blockers inhibit the parasympathetic, so if we stop the cholinergic activities, it kind of promotes that fight or flight activity. Anticholinergics are very common and they can treat a variety of conditions from urinary incontinence and asthma to open the airway and dry secretions and certain types of poisonings. They also help block involuntary muscle movements with certain disorders. Sometimes they're used before surgery to help maintain bodily functions during anesthesia. Anticholinergics may also be used for the control of nausea and to dry up secretions with seasonal allergies. We've already covered pain medication in the last chapter, but pain medications are included in this chapter because of the effect they have on the nervous system. This topic requires a quick review because we give these analgesics so often, and when medications affect the central nervous system, remember they have the potential for serious side effects. Analgesics reduce pain without eliminating feelings. You have your salicylates, which include aspirin. Again, watch for GI bleed. They're not recommended for children because of the risk of Ray's syndrome and signs of aspirin toxicity is tinnitus or ringing in the ear. Tylenol is a pain reliever but doesn't work with the prostaglandins so there's no anti-inflammatory effect. Remember that they can damage the liver. The NSAIDs, which include ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin, they inhibit prostaglandin synthesis 
And remember we talked about the arachidonic acid and the cox, which combine to make prostaglandins, and that creates pain, fever, and inflammation. So our NSAIDs block this action, but watch for GI bleed. Also, they can have an adverse effect is kidney damage. Opioid analgesics are our strongest pain relievers. Remember, we have different schedules according to the potential for abuse and addiction. Morphine is a commonly used narcotic, and it's a Schedule II. And again, remember, because these medications depress the central nervous system, we have to watch for serious side effects. With these opioid analgesics, that serious side effect is respiratory depression. Again, here's our mnemonic, A, B, C, D, for side effects of these opioid analgesics. A is for apnea or absence of breathing. B is for bradycardia. Again, watch your blood pressure. It can go down. C is for constipation. And D is for dysphoria, dysuria, and dyspepsia. Anesthesia means to lose sensation. A local anesthesia produces numbness and a localized loss of feeling. The patient remains conscious. Local anesthetics come in creams, sprays, otic, and injectables. An injectable example is lidocaine or xylocaine. There are amides and esters. Amides have a longer duration and few side effects. Esters can cause severe allergic reactions, and they're used only topically like benzocaine or novocaine. General anesthesia is a state produced when a patient receives medications for amnesia, analgesia, muscle paralysis, and sedation. An anesthetized patient can be thought of as being in a controlled, reversible state of unconsciousness. IV infusions are used first, usually are like midazolam, which is Versed, and propofol, which is Diprovan. Then an inhalation anesthetic gas is used, which usually ends with a fluorine, such as isoflurane. These gases are volatile, and they can help depress respiration and cardiovascular function. When we give IV medication first during anesthesia, this helps lower the amount of gases that are needed and lowers the risk of serious side effects for the patient. Alcohol is a known central nervous system depressant. CNS depression refers to physiological depression of the central nervous system, which results in those serious side effects in decreased rate of breathing, decreased heart rate, and potential loss of consciousness at higher doses. The more the depressant, the weaker the breathing can become and eventually stop it entirely. Mixing alcohol with other CNS depressants like our benzodiazepines that we're going to talk about and our opioids, they can cause a fatal reaction. Alcohol can render some medic medications ineffective and some may become more potent. Signs of chronic alcohol use are irritability, confusion, GI problems, and blackouts. Disulfiram or Atabuse is an alcohol antagonist and is used to treat alcoholism. It works by blocking the process of alcohol in the body, so it causes you to get sick when you drink. Other side effects may include flushing, tachycardia, thirst, chest pain, vertigo, and low blood pressure. Well, that concludes the first lecture on the nervous system medications.